that is a view. Pure sound of music, but I'll resist giving you a rendition. But it looks like a majestic mountainous dead end. But actually there's a road up there and has been for over 200 years. It's the second highest paved road in the Alps and absolutely the most famous. The Germans call it the Stilfser Jock, but you know it better as the Stelvio Pass. So dream scenario, if you could drive anything up there, what would it be? It needs to have as much drama as this place and sound amazing. How about this? Yeah, it's Lamborghini's new Countach. 800 horsepower V12, yeah, that ought to do it. Now, the reason this particular spot is really significant is that back in 1932, this was the start of the first ever race to the summit. So I think without further ado, I should go and discover the Stelvio. I mean, this is a proper pinch yourself moment. So exciting. Yeah, about that, the pass obviously is currently closed. This is not your standard amazing supercar on beautiful road story. No, it's even better than that because tomorrow they are opening the Stelvio Pass for us to have to ourselves for an entire day. Yeah, proper pinch yourself stuff. So right now there's nothing else for it that to turn around, go back down and grab a bite to eat. Six fifteen in the morning outside our apartment block, and it looks like we're set for an absolute belter of a day. I absolutely can't wait, but I want to show you what we had to do last night. So down this ramp here, we had to reverse the Kuntash down here last night because we tried reversing it up a slope earlier, and the clutch doesn't seem to like reversing up. So in the dark and the rain, we had to reverse it down this rather broken concrete slope. Now it's got nose lift, but the nose lift only lifts it about that much. You still can't get your fingers under with a nose lift up. So there's not a lot of ground clearance, but luckily this slope's not too steep. But when we got down here and into the garage, we found out that we had been comprehensively outpointed. Come and have a look at what else is inside. And if you come around behind, someone's turned up in a well, let's call it an old bastardised F1 car. But look, Ayrton Senna's name on the side. JPS livery. Apparently it runs, it's 500 kilos, and apparently it runs a sort of, some sort of highly tuned two litre engine running about 370 horsepower. It's different, there was a bit of a language barrier going on with the owner. Try it first. Oh, 1950, oh, yeah, yeah, go to me. Okay. <laughs> but oh my god, just to turn up in a car park with a Countach and assume you'd be the best thing in there and then someone turn up in this. He challenged me to a race up the Stelvio last night. I'm not sure that's a great idea. But anyway, should we get this started and um, head up the road? So off we go, climbing the Stelvio. And here is the famous Hairpin 46. Now the road actually starts at 48, but 46 was the start line when they used to do auto races here. The first car race on the Stelvio was in 1898. That's not amazing. Before that, it was coach and horses to the top. It used to take like six hours or more to get from Trafoy, where we've just driven through, to the summit. So you come to the Stelvio and expect it to be this beautiful, sinuous rhythm of tarmac. And actually, it's really narrow and it's really bumpy, especially down the bottom. So the reason the Stelvio is so narrow is because it was never designed with cars in mind. It was a military road 200 years ago. Or well, the idea for it came in 1818 or something. It was back when Napoleon was throwing his weight around in Europe and the Austro-Hungarian Empire wanted to tie itself together a bit. They needed a road between their power centres in Vienna 
and on the other side of the Alps in Milan and Venice. So they looked along the Alps and went, well, we can't go through Switzerland and everything the other side is covered in glaciers, so we'll need to go over the Stelvio. Are you starting to get a picture about the road? It's not a road that's like yee-haw, flat out in second and third gear. This is one you sort of have to be very, very careful on. Right, hang on, slow down, because this bit is quite tricky. We don't have the pass entirely to ourselves. We're sharing it with the Stelvio's road repair teams, but they're mainly working lower down. But the trees are starting to fall back. The view's starting to get magnificent. Oh, this is just so epically cool. So how is the Kuntash coping with this? Probably better than its driver, to be fair. But the problem, one of the things is, the nose lift goes back down at really quite low speed. It's like 40 k's, and you do get up to 40 k's between the hairpins, which means that you're trying to judge each hairpin on whether you're going to need the nose lift. This one should be all right. To help you round it. It's just so daunting, because you've climbed so high already, and then you just look up this valley and you just see this endless swip swap of hairpins going up. I love the rhythm of this road because it starts in thick trees at the bottom and you just sort of start picking up views through the trees and the trees thin and then you get some sort of more summery grasslands and then you just enter this world of austerity, this grey and white rock faces and mountain tops and peaks and it just looks, even now, with the sun out and the, most of the snow gone, it looks hostile. Actually, this is a good place to stop because I need to talk to you about something. And because this is a Delvio and it's closed, I can stop wherever I like. And it's this. You don't just flick a switch and open the Stelvio Pass overnight. No, it takes six to eight weeks, depending on how much snowfall there's been, in the previous season. So that snow clearance comes first, working from the bottom to the top. And after that, they can work on the resurfacing, the road repairs, the retaining walls, and everything else. The last thing they do involves these. They have to walk people down these slopes, kicking off all the loose rock that might fall during the summer season. They clearly haven't got to this bit yet. I'm gonna get back to it. So let me tell you a little bit about this car. Underneath, it's a Cyan, which itself was based on an Aventador. And there's good things to do with that, and there's old bad things. Bad things are mainly that it's now 11 years old, the basic chassis, and it's got a few little foibles that most rivals, not that this has rivals, have now got round. The good thing about that is it means it's got a naturally aspirated 6.5 litre V12 in the back, which now develops 770 horsepower. But what an engine this is to use. The little chuckles from it on the overrun and just the stridency and ability and the fact it's naturally aspirated so there's no delays. What a majestic engine to use in a majestic place. And that's basically what you're doing in the Kuntash and any V12 Lamborghini. You are an engine transportation device. You use the car to get you somewhere and just it's the experience of the engine that is the richest, most tantalizing and addictive thing about the whole car. So it's got all that power plus a motor, an electric motor between the engine and the gearbox. That only delivers another 34 horsepower and it's mainly torque fill during gear changes. All the same, it's 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, 0 to 124 in 8.6 and a maximum speed of 221 miles an hour. So it's ridiculously fast. Only 112 being made. They've all been sold. They're two million euros plus tax. And I'm gonna move on and tell you about the gearbox. Because the gearbox in this, it's that old sequential manual which the Aventador's had since it was new 11 years ago. It's not double clutch, obviously. It's a single clutch gearbox. And it's a bit of a hassle around here. On the tight corners for the hairpins, you have to drop it down to first. And because I like to left foot brake, it really doesn't like that. If you 
brake with your left and put any pressure on the throttle with your right. It cuts all the power. So it means I'm coming out of hairpins in second gear and then it's taken all the power away and because the momentum falls away, you have to drop it down to first to get out and da 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 da. So, look, here you go. So I do this, right, there, right. And then nothing, 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 nothing. Going up the other slope, nothing. Change down to first. Something, off we go. It's not exactly a cutting edge gearbox. I know Lamborghini have improved it and with the hybrid system in this, that is designed to torque fill for the gears, but really it's still slow and it doesn't quite do it enough basically because we're using the wrong point in the rev range. We're not up the gears because on the Stelvio pass you can't be because it's not a pass. You can drive flat out, certainly not this side of it. Well, that's sort of fine. It's not like this car or this road are about the last nuance of handling balance and finesse and everything else. It's about the event and the experience of driving here. That's what the Stelvio gives you and that's what the Countach gives you. Because if you're gonna pick holes, you could pick quite a lot in this car. It's too much car for the road, I think you'd probably say. But I expected that and I knew that and I just, it's not what this story is about, what this adventure is about. This is about having the Stelvio pass to yourself, driving up it, driving down it, doing what you want, stopping where you want, having a look at the views, doing anything because there's no one else here. You've got it to yourself. Time then to stop and have a look around the car. Right, how to start this? <laughs> come clean I guess. When I first saw the Countach I thought it was a travesty, I hated it. The original was such a seminal moment in car design, it defined the 70s and yet here was Lamborghini telling us this is how it would have evolved. But the problem was the original wasn't about evolution, it was revolution. So let's park that and consider this as a piece of design. Although I'm finding it hard to do that because it's quite difficult to separate the car from the experience I'm having with it. Which on the Stelvio Pass, when you've got a black and white car with that backdrop, is quite hard to do. But on the whole, I think the front end is really successful. This front three quarter angle with the angles on the bonnet and the cutaways around the wheel arch is really successful. But what I wish they'd done is made the creases sharper and the surfaces flatter to really give it more of that retro tone. So sort of a Lamborghini is about caricature, it's about extravagance. And I think with the, with the Countach recreation, they could have gone a little bit further. And at the rear, there's too much Cyan, Shan, it's another Lamborghini name I don't know how to pronounce. But on the whole, I'm a lot better disposed to it today than I was yesterday. If you're still not convinced, look at it this way. Two million euros a pop, and 112 being built. That is over 200 million euros of income for Lamborghini that they can put into the development of the next Aventador. But right now, I just want to drive. Beyond the summit, I point the Countach at the southern side of the Stelvio as it drops down towards Bormio. It's less dramatic than the northern flank, but much better to drive with more open roads running through snowfields and valleys. No, it's not making full power in the thin air up here, but it just doesn't matter. To come here and have these mountains, views, and this sensational road to myself is plain incredible. The summit of the Stelvio Pass. Now there's a separation here because on this road, the Countach isn't a great driver's car. It doesn't have the space it needs to stretch its long, long legs. But that's not surprising because the Stelvio itself isn't a great driver's road, this side, the iconic side of it at least. But what both have in common is drama and excitement and scale. This car on this road, this closed road, it's one of the great automotive experiences. Mind blown.